saw it last night. Did y'all see it? You know something? John Moran ain't the future. He's now. This brother is on another level. And guess what? That leaves me in a quandary. Well, who the damn MVP? Is it Embiid? Is it Ja? Is it DeMar DeRozan? Is it Jokic? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Now, normally, I would bring Eminem, a.k.a. Monica, Monica McNutt, to sit up in here and debate me face to face. <laughs> but I had to get to that level. She, she, she's stuck in New York. I'm sorry. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> First takes in the house. Let's go. <laughs> Good day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome into First Take. Monica McNutt, always good to see my girl have you with us. Are you happy? <laughs> Are you happy I'm now? Good. I'm good. I mean, I, I, <laughs> That's my main concern. Well, I'm, I'm happy. I okay. still have not recovered from missing the Super Bowl. Okay. Not being here for the Super Bowl. I still mm. have, it's going to take me years to recover okay. from that one. But I am here, and you don't get to tease me about you being here, and I'm not. So I'm happy about that. Fair enough. Yeah. Here's what I'm going to do. We're having internet struggle, so I'm going to give you my laptop all right, in case okay. you need that. All That's right, all set for you. Thank and you I'm going to get to Ja because he's the real show. Ladies and gentlemen, Ja Morant is a man amongst boys. Morant breaking his own franchise record for points in a regular Wait. season game just two days after setting it, putting up 52 points, just having his way with the Spurs last night in a 118-105 win. As far as making a case for MVP, he also had a massive dunk in a buzzer beater to take the halftime lead. Here's the man of the hour. What was the most memorable thing you'll take from this or uh, you'll remember probably for the rest of your life? Got to be the 50 ball, man. First in history. Mm -hmm. I ain't going to lie. I don't know if I can talk about that right now, man. My head all over the place. He's a beautiful player. I mean, you know, what else can you say about him? And it's not just that he's athletic. And everybody says, hey, he's athletic. Somebody says, you know, he's a freak of nature, you know, because he's so fast. And he's this. But, you know, he, he makes decisions. Uh, he, he knows what's going on in the court. So, you know, you combine that cerebral part of his game with the athleticism, and you got a special kid. All right, the Hall of Famer, Allen Iverson, took to Twitter following just 52-point performance, sharing this photo of his 2001 MVP trophy, tagging Morant while saying, sooner or later. Stephen A., yes. I know Joel Embiid is that dude, mm -hmm. but Ja is making a strong case right now. Yeah. At this moment, is he the MVP? No. Um, I, I still think that when you consider what DeMar DeRozan is doing in the Eastern Conference and at the top seed in the Eastern Conference, they were winning games even when Zach Levine is going down and he was putting up 35-plus a night. You've got to take that in consideration. I think the adversity that Joel Embiid had to go through in Philadelphia because of the drama and the soap opera that involved Ben Simmons. You've got to take him into consideration. There is no definitive MVP right now. As far as I'm, I mean, uh, I said it weeks ago, it's fluid. It's fluid. It's Embiid one week. It's DeMar DeRozan the next. It's Jokic the next. You can't ignore what he's been doing in Denver because he hasn't had Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. And so we, when we consider the level of stress and drama that Joel Embiid has had to go through, when we consider the kind of arduous circumstances Jokic had to go through. When we consider what, uh, obviously, you look at Joel Embiid again, the DeMar DeRozan, and then Jokic and what he's had to go through, you take into account John Morant. Now, he hasn't had Dylan, and we get all of that, but Bain and Jaron Jackson and those boys can ball. They're exceptionally well coached. We got to give credit where credit is due is that. They got some young athletic lions on their squad to go with John Morant. John Morant is definitely in the discussion. He's right there. At, and, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a race to the finish line. These last few weeks are going to tell it to us. But here's what I will say about John Morant. Okay. Outside of the spectacular and all of that stuff, like the great Greg Popovich pointed out, the brother knows how to play basketball, and we get all of that. You know who you can call John Morant right now, ladies and gentlemen? You can call him Kevin Durant. Why would I bring up Kevin Durant? Yeah, how so? Like Kevin Durant, John Morant was the number two overall pick. Mm -hmm. Like Kevin Durant, he's going to be the guy we're talking about. Greg Oden went down, obviously perpetual knee injuries, you know, no, you know, new, you know not just negated his career. 
and we understand that he was the number one overall pick. Kevin Durant was number two. Well, Zion Williamson, number one overall pick, who's number two? Ja Morant. What's Zion Williams doing? I mean, we don't know what the hell he's doing. We sincerely hope he ain't eating Twinkies. We hope that he's on that treadmill and those Peloton bikes and keeping his weight down because that's a big brother right there. And we know how great Zion Williamson is when he's on the court. He's something to behold, but he hasn't been on the court. Ja Morant has. And as the number two overall pick, who had a number one overall pick that was perpetually injured, okay, Ja Morant, and Kevin Durant's careers are actually mirroring one another to this point in John Morant's career because of where they were drafted, who was drafted before them in terms of their perpetual injuries and what they are doing on the basketball court. And that's why I said when I think about John Morant, I also think about Kevin Durant. All right, Stephen A. <clears throat> I know you're out in L.A. and you, you got to play this role and you're prepared to do all the things that you do so greatly. But there's something you said in that argument that I'm going to go ahead and lean in on and take to the next step. You said that MVP is fluid. I agree with you 100%. Fluid. Fluid. It is moving. However, on this glorious Tuesday, March 1st, at, what time is it? 10.07. The MVP in the league for me right now, at this moment, in this fluid conversation, would be one John Morant. And I think all of the names that you rattled off are incredible and it is absolutely going to be a race to the finish photo finish who can lean their head forward and their nose touch that ribbon first but right now i really think you have to give it to john morant because last night i was looking forward to the bulls versus the miami heat and i was disappointed because the chicago bulls that was sitting atop the standings did not necessarily show up credit the miami heat and so as i'm watching those two guys right now the nod goes to john morant and then you talk about joel and beat who has been tremendous but honestly, Stephen A., I think that there is credence for the idea that James Harden's addition to the Philadelphia 76ers will weaken the argument that Joel Embiid well, has that. for MVP. And so to me, right now in this fluid conversation, you have to give the nod to Ja. I agree with you about those young Lions and that squad. That front office has done a tremendous job. Um, they have been, been coached very well. But when I look at that roster, outside of Stephen Adams... There's not a ton of experience, uh -huh. which okay. to me only adds to Jaws' case as a leader well, and an MVP candidate. Right now, at this moment. But, but that's a decent argument, Monica. I'm not going to ignore well, and throw you. shade on your argument entirely. What I would remind you of, I mean, you have been on the show numerous, numerous times, okay? Numerous uh -huh. times. Doing the great job that you've been doing. I haven't heard you talk about John Moran. I haven't seen you bring him up. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to hold that against you, was, you though. Because you I, was out. I, I didn't, I didn't hear out. you bring him up. I didn't hear you bring him up. I know Steve I brought May. him up. But here's the deal. He's Steve got May. 46. He's got 52, okay? When we're seeing about, don't get me wrong, we, he sprinkled in a few 30-point games here and there, okay? He had 23, 26, had 44-point game, then had a 20-point game, whatever. When we talked about Joel Embiid and what he was bringing to the table, those were monster numbers that he was bringing. When we talked about DeMar DeRozan and what he did over a nine-game stretch and with Chicago being in the lead and with the Eastern Conference being more significant than they've been in recent memory, we can't ignore that either, particularly with Zach Levine going down. So I'm not taking anything away from John Moran. He might end up winning this. Certainly from a box office attraction, you can put him up there as number one, even ahead of Embiid, Jokic, and DeMar DeRozan. Ja Morant is box office. That is something that we got to pay attention to because as a voter, that does play a role. When you're putting up similar numbers, yes, voter. when you show up in crunch time, when you're winning <laughs> basketball games and all of these different things, all of those things are worthy of being pointed to. We can't negate them. But in the end, when we're talking about Memphis, we talk about them being the number four or obviously a number three seed in the Western Conference. Could they get to number two? We know they can, particularly with the Warriors struggling with their injuries. We've seen Phoenix, but CP3 goes down. They're clearly the number one seed, and CP3 was in the conversation. But in Chicago, they're the number one seed. In Chicago, they were winning Here. basketball games, and they were ahead of everybody else. And DeMar DeRozan, without question, was leading the way in the house that MJ built with a statue of MJ outside. We can't ignore that. You are absolutely right, Stephen A. And this is why, again, everybody might go crazy that I said it, but that was at 10.07. The time has changed. 10.10, 10, he's still my MVP. However, in the case of Chicago, I am very, very curious to see how things unfold because when I checked that All-Star break, they had to go on the road, I believe, 
for 12 out of the 17 we games at the end of March. Mm. And Exactly. And so their schedule is about to be a gauntlet. Through most of the regular season outside of last night where the Bulls slipped up, or I shouldn't even say slipped up because the loss isn't necessarily a slip up. It's how they lost to the Miami Heat. Through most of the season, I think that DeMar DeRozan has probably been the leader in the clubhouse for MVP. But at this moment on this show, on this day, this an answer is subject to change. I'm going with Ja. <laughs> All right, let, let's let's stay with Ja here. And let me ask you this, Stephen A. So now Memphis, you've talked about how countdown's going out to Memphis. We know this is a big deal. He's yeah. big time. They've won nine. They're big time. Of, yeah, yeah. They've won nine of their last ten. When we talk about the Warriors, they've lost five of their last seven. I realize they've got some bodies down that will be returning. But do you believe right now in the standings, they're third in the West. Can Ja lead the Grizz to a title? He can, but he won't. And I love Ja Morant. It was great seeing him at All-Star Weekend. I'm a fan, and I think the Memphis Grizzlies fans should deeply appreciate the brother that they got there doing his thing and the team they have there doing their thing. Make no mistake about it. And I know that they've beaten the Warriors a couple of times. They faced them this season. I know all of that, but I'm not concerned. The Warriors ain't losing to the Memphis Grizzlies, a healthy Warriors squad. <clears throat> Injured, that's different. A healthy Warriors squad ain't losing to the Memphis Grizzlies. I don't think a healthy Phoenix Sun squad is losing to the Memphis Grizzlies. I think the Memphis Grizzlies are coming. Mm -hmm. I think with Ja Morant, there's a title in their future. I think the Memphis Grizzlies could make some noise this year and knock off one, not both, but knock off somebody big. I get all of that. But I believe that when it's fi the finals comes around, I, unfortunately, because I am no fan of San Francisco, I, unfortunately, will be in San Francisco. I am a fan, uh, I am a fan of that arena. There's but I'm not great a restaurants in San Francisco, the, the, by the listen, way, and great shopping. There's great, carry on. There's great it's a the lot weather. of things in San Francisco, and there's some things that's not so great, but I ain't getting into that, okay? <laughs> the bottom line is, is that San Francisco does not turn me on, all right? But I'm going to be there because I believe that the Golden State Warriors are going to the finals. And I think all of this is mere bag of shells. I think all of this is mere bag of shells. When the playoffs come, you got to deal with Clay. You got to deal with Steph. You got to deal with Dre setting them up. Mm -hmm. You got to deal with some of the young bodies, fresh legs, and a stout defensive team when they really amp it up that you got to contend with. With Wiseman coming back, I'm not sleeping on that. That is what I believe. Memphis Grizzlies will be on that. They're going to make it to the conference semifinals, all right? Okay. But one of them brothers go knock Memphis off. That's what I believe. Where are you, my oh. So before I begin to respond to Stephen A., Stephen A., riddle me this. Last year, did you have the Phoenix Suns going to the finals? I did not. Okay. So with that being our case study, y'all know a few weeks ago, Stephen A. told me he would fire me as his defense attorney, so I'm ready today. <clears throat> anyway. Let's go. Uh, with yeah. that being our case study, <laughs> there is no reason for me to believe, as you just pointed out, that the Memphis Grizzlies cannot knock off a perceived power in the West. Here's why. When I look at the Golden State Warriors, I have the, had the opportunity to be on the sideline, coaches meeting, so on and so forth. The discussion has been made about how teams are defending the Warriors this year. Steve Kerr agreed it's the kitchen sink and then some, and part of that is because the rest of the league has sort of caught up in terms of how to defend Steph Curry. So that's one. And if any team jumps up to defend one Steph Curry, it is the Memphis Grizzlies. Two, Draymond Green, as the catalyst of this squad, as my colleague George Sedano pointed out last night on Around the Horn, is dealing with a back injury. I don't know about you, Stephen A., but as my experience in back injuries personally and with friends and family, back injuries are one wrong bump from being back to square zero in terms of your recovery. And I think boxing out is a big part of the game of basketball, and so I'm not ready to bank on <clears throat> Draymond Green being able to return at, four, at full strength and be sustainable throughout a playoff run. When it comes to the Phoenix Suns, who I love and I actually believe probably will be in the finals, Chris Paul is their clutchest player. They are without Chris Paul right now. When Chris Paul returns in the, the postseason, while I trust him to a great degree, when I look at the supporting cast in terms of folks that are excited about defense, the matchups are actually very, very intriguing with the Phoenix Suns. And beyond all of those X's and O's, just like the Phoenix Suns were playing with house money last year, the Memphis Grizzlies have the privilege of arriving early, which to me allows them to shed any pressure and they just get to go out and play basketball with the swag of one job, Morant. And Fair so, enough, so are you picking why not? 
The Memphis Grizzlies to the finals. I, I understand you giving, you're giving rationale and reasons as to why they could make the finals. I agree with all of that, but are you picking them? Sure. Let's do it. Let's go. Oh, let's. Oh, so you just you just decided at this moment that I put you on the spot. Oh, let, let's do it. Let's do it. But that's not where you were. Listen. So let, let's discuss why you were not there. Because you understand that as talented as they are, okay, inexperience does come into play, particularly as it's games true. get tighter and more is on the line. We believe in John Morant. We believe his brother's going to be a league MVP, if not this year, very shortly in the very near future. We get all that. We understand it, okay? But at the end of the day, we understand that playoff basketball is a different beast, okay? You play better defense. You get back on defense a lot more. You give up less fast break opportunities, okay? Cohesiveness matters, and instead of going at you one particular night, you get the game plan for a best four out of seven series. All of those things come into play. It's true. And that's when experience, experience has proven time and time and time again to usurp and dwarf young talent. And when I look at the Memphis Grizzlies, I think they're coming. I, don't, I wouldn't be shocked if they made it to the conference finals. But I don't have them going to the finals. I tell you that right now. I got the Golden State Warriors going to the finals. All right? And for those that are asking me, what's my problem with San Francisco? Look, man, I prefer Southern California, okay, rather than Northern California. <laughs> San Francisco reminds me too much of New York. And every time I'm in San Francisco, outside of the hills, I, it ends up making me say to myself, why the hell did I fly this far just to be in New York? OK, I might as well have stayed in New York rather than fly across the country to experience the same things with more hills. That's why I, I, I'm down on San Francisco, just so we understand. I don't want people getting it twisted and trying to make stuff up. That is my issue with the city and their taxes. You really just talked about the hill. <laughs> taxes. In San Francisco, you really just talked about I mean, that. You, like, you want to take, you want to take, uh, listen, the I, love, I love the movie The Rock. It's one of my favorite movies with Nicolas Cage and, and the great like Sean, Han and Sean Connery. No, make no mistake about it. Yeah. But I mean, I, and I love the trailer, you know, the, you know, the little trolleys and stuff like that. It's really, really nice. But if I'm walking, I don't feel like walking up and down those damn hills. Oh. Okay, I don't. You're a, I don't. You're a different cat. I, don't. I, don't. I just don't feel like you're doing it. You're a different cat. I just don't feel like doing it's it. That's good. all. It's good for the glutes that's a, that's a, to, to get a little inclined. I understand. Inclined. I understand. All right, help, I understand. Well, you go do that. You go do that. <laughs> that Y'all, you do, you, Monica. You it go do great that. for the glutes. I, I'm, I'm not down with it. I, I'm, I'm Monica, a Southern California Monica, brother. this guy's something Instead special. of Northern California. Okay. I've yes, been, he is. All right, I'm just saying. Oh, my goodness. Let's go, let's go, let's go. All let's right, go. Well, you guys are done? I'm done, I'm okay. done. I've said, oh, Monica agrees with me. She don't want to admit it to the world, but she agrees with me. All right, we'll leave it there. Listen, I disagree. Because... the only point that we disagree on is I got Phoenix surviving. But I listen, none of us will be surprised if Memphis does it. She got Phoenix, I got Golden State. Okay. All right? Yeah. TP3, sir. We're, we're aware you have Golden State, don't worry. That's right. Just no hills. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got it. <laughs> Only flat. No Only flat. Treadmill at 1.0 incline. That's All right, let's get to baseball. Monica will be back in just a bit. So after 16 hours of meetings that wrapped around 2.30 a.m., Major League Baseball and the MLB Players Association moved the deadline for a new collective bargaining agreement that would save regular season games from being canceled to 5 p.m. today. Meanwhile, Bryce Harper had some time to kill. Look at this tweet, Stephen A. We'll pull that up for you. Uh... I don't know whether we should be laughing or crying at this point. MLB insider Jeff Passan is here with the latest. Jeff, I understand that we made some progress yesterday. Good to see you, sir. I know you're traveling. Thank you for squeezing us in. Tell me this. Should we be encouraged? I think we should be about as encouraged, Molly, as Stephen A. is when he's walking up a hill, which is to say, <laughs> yeah, like a little bit. I'm out here doing this. I'm making some progress, but it's not necessarily something I like. That That's where the players are right now. Look, there was such a big gap between Major League Baseball and the Players Association going into yesterday that the, the idea that a deal could get done in one day was going to take a monumental leap from the league. That monumental leap did not happen. And with a 5 p.m. deadline today, I'm not sure that there's anything that's going to cajole the league at this point into making that monumental leap. And if it gets to that point, it's going to be awfully interesting to see what the resolve of the players actually is. There are always going to be players who, on the cusp of spring training, or now, you know, with spring training should have been started two weeks ago, they want to just go play. They want to get paid. They want to do all this. But player leaders have been adamant that this is different that this is not just for now, that this is for the future. And if the players don't stand up to Major League Baseball, then 
the game as they know it is going to fundamentally change going forward, and it's going to be worse for future generations than it is right now. Jeff, I got a couple of questions for you, man, because obviously, you, you know, you're a guru covering the sport, man, and you, you get right to the point, okay? Are we talking about ultimately games being missed here? I mean, do you consider that a likelihood? We all know it's possible, but I'm asking you to distinguish the difference between possible and likely. Are we likely talking about Major League Baseball missing games? And if so, how many? If... If Major League Baseball does not make a demonstrable move in the direction of the players today, games will be missed. Simple as that. When you the, the, when the, you players are not, the players go are ahead, not going to take this deal that's on the table right now and not going to take anything in its vicinity. They need to go higher on the luxury tax threshold. They need to go higher on minimums. They need to go higher on a number of things that, that are out there right now, backstops for uh, small market teams that okay. aren't spending money. I mean, there's a lot in, in what what the players have dropped to this point. They've dropped a lot more, frankly, than some players even wanted to, Stephen A. Eh? Well, listen, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting you to some degree because I got a couple of questions that I want to get in here. Okay, so you say they're going to miss some games. How many games do you believe Major League Baseball can afford to miss without sacrificing the allure of the sport? Two fans who would be totally disgusted, you know, if, if, if baseball missed games. I mean, what can they afford to sacrifice at this point in your estimation? Your educated guess is what I'm asking. None. That's the actual answer, Stephen A. Baseball's in a place right now where it's a sport that needs resonance. And you are not resonating throughout the public unless you're actually playing games. You're not seeing Fernando Tatis Jr. and Shohei Otani and Mike Trout and Ronald Acuna Jr. and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Jacob deGrom, these magnificent stars that are in the sport unless they're actually playing the games. So that's the calculus for Major League Baseball. That's what they stand to lose. They stand to lose resonance, relevance, uh, you know, being part of this sporting society where we're talking about this stuff every day and passionate about it. And by saying we're not going to give the players what they want, of course you're not going to give them exactly what they want, but yeah. if you're not going to move in the sort of direction that pays them commensurate with where revenues have gone, Stephen A., then oh, no. you might as well be but saying yeah. you, you players are not valuable enough to us. Jeff, I get that. And, and I'm not questioning how right you are. I agree with you. But this is the point that I think people need you to address. If you just said that baseball can afford to lose none of the players, last time I checked, the owners got more money than the players. So those billionaires that might, that, that, that obviously it's not advisable for them to compromise their business, Jeff, technically or from a literal sense, they can't afford it. Because they're billionaires, uh, uh, at least yeah. some of them anyway. So what yeah. I'm asking you is this. The player resolve, they know what you know. They know what the sport can't afford. They know that they stand to lose because their pockets ain't different, ain't, ain't, you know, ain't deep. Ain't, uh, there's, it's, their pockets are not as deep as the owners who cut their checks. Right. So what kind of resolve do you think the players have That's it. knowing what you know that the sport cannot afford to have any games canceled. Stephen A., we're, I'm not going to say we are about to find out. We may find out the answer to that question. And, and listen, I understand that there's posturing going on at this point and that the players with whom I spoke yesterday, veterans, young guys, like I was, I was trying to sort of cast a wide swath yesterday just to see where players are right now. And every one of them, this may just be a line, every one of them said, I'm willing to miss the season. Now, is that actually true? We're, you know, we don't know until that happens. But the idea that they're going to get bled out quickly, I just don't find to be particularly compelling. And, and let's, let's also recall, Stephen A., that these owners who have all this money were complaining during the 2020 season that was shortened by COVID that they were having, and I'm using an actual quote here, biblical losses. Let's remember these same people have taken these franchises that have appreciated so greatly in value 
and leverage them by taking out loans, whether it's to build things around the stadium area or to supplement other businesses. Uh, you have a bunch of leveraged businessmen here. And if all of a sudden there are no baseball games, there are no revenues coming in and uh, you know, people start looking at baseball like, uh, what's baseball? It's, it's fallen off the map. Nobody cares about it anymore. All of a sudden, those franchise values are going to go down. And so it, it goes both ways, right? I understand that uh, in a micro sense, yes, of course, owners are richer than players. But in the macro sense, the reality is the owners have a lot at stake here, too, because these businesses that they have built up and that are worth so much right now stand a chance to lose as well. Okay. Yeah, and what are the owners without the players at the end of the day? I don't know, Jeff. I'm feeling Billionaires. I'm feeling like but okay. you know what I mean. I know that I'm just saying sports, that's Stephen how, A. I'm just saying how they sports. are. I, I'm talking about how they I know, are. I'm yes, done. they're like, yeah, this is who we are. Yeah. We got our money. Okay. Can, okay. can we talk about your guy, El Capitan? El Capitan. You were also all over the story yesterday, and it was interesting that it broke the same day as that self-imposed deadline. So Jeter released the following statement. Today I'm announcing that the Miami Marlins and I are officially ending our relationship. I will no longer serve as CEO nor as a shareholder in this club. The vision for the future of this franchise is different than the one I signed up to lead. Now is the right time for me to step aside as a new season begins. You know, Jeff, I really have two questions for you here. One, how does Jeter look walking away right now? And also, in what capacity would you like to see an icon like Derek Jeter working in the sport of baseball? Oh, boy. I mean, the timing of it wasn't great, right? Uh, you see somebody who, I, I'm not going to say Derek Jeter is the most popular baseball player still after, you know, five Seven years after his retirement, um, Derek Jeter might actually be the most popular baseball Seriously. player still. And to see him walk away, on, uh, to see him walk away under those circumstances, uh, it's, a, it's a bad look for the team. It's a bad look for the sport. And you're always going to have people spinning behind the scenes as to what the reason behind the departure was. And uh, there have been questions. Was it a, uh, hey, we don't fit anymore or a, hey, you don't fit anymore. And getting that story is probably not going to come out anytime soon. But uh, Derek Jeter needs to be involved with baseball in some capacity. Because if he's not, frankly, baseball is just what? missing another opportunity for somebody who connects with fans and who fans yes. relate to. Yep. And that's all you want. Jeff, yep. Jeff, I have to say, I don't like the way you sound right now. I mean, Jer Jer Derek Jeter has to be involved in some capacity. What do you mean some capacity? We know where he belongs. He is a Yankee. El Capitan, the <laughs> champion extraordinaire, the leader. He is, he is Derek Jeter. What is this? I mean, he has to be involved. As far as I'm concerned, the, the, the resident sitcom itself that's, Hank, that's Hank and Howe with the Steinbrenners, or, or you, know, you know, whoever it is. I mean, I don't care. Brian Cashman, whatever. I mean, that, how are these people Yankees? Okay, all right, and, and 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 Aaron Boone and others, and Derek Jeter is not a Yankee. You find a position, you create a very high, significant, influencing position for this man, and the only excuse not to is that the commissioner wants Derek Jeter in the commissioner's office in some significant capacity for Major League Baseball. This is El Capitan. This is Derek Jeter. That's what we're talking about, Jeff Bassett. You sit up there like, uh, you know, uh, he, he needs to be involved in baseball. That's not good enough. We know where he belongs. Whenever you say that. Stephen A., I don't tell a man where to work. Oh, Lord. Uh. Oh, oh, come on, oh, I love Jeff. when you're animated come on, Jeff. and Jeff is just Come on, dry. Jeff. Come it's on, the Jeff. Best. Come on, man. It's, it's, it's El Capitan. It's Derek Jeter. Okay. All right. You don't tell me. Wait, wait, well, you know what? I can. Where are you I, from, Jeff? I can. <laughs> Jeff, where are you from? <laughs> Jeff's crazy, man. Come on, Jeff. I'm from, I'm from the old school. I'm from the old school where a man decides where he wants to work. Uh, and if Derek uh, Jeter wants to work with the Yankees, biased, he should go work with the Yankees. Oh, no, 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 Jeff, I apologize. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I should tell Derek Jeter where to go. I'm saying, if you're the Yankees, you, you, you should, should desperately 
they want him yeah. with the Yankees. Well, That's what yes, I'm saying. We're just trying to help with the marketing efforts. We want to revive baseball. We want it back to its glory days. Hey, That's hey, what we're listen. Trying. And you're with I, us on that. Listen, we know let, that. Let, let me let me say let, let me say let me say something. That I, okay. I I would love to. Stephen A. You are on one this morning, and I am so thankful that I was here to witness it. Honestly, that was it was a beautiful thing to see. And uh, you do beautiful things every day. And I appreciate you for that, my man. Your passion, it's the best. And I hope Derek Jeter goes back to the New York Yankees just so you can have a smile on your face so that when yes. you walk up that hill, you're not out of breath by the time you're at the top. And maybe he'll actually stop complaining when he's in New York now. So that'll be good, too, if that well, listen, listen, Let me tell you something right now. <laughs> the, su the sun shines when Derek Jeter is with the Yankees. The okay. sun <laughs> shines, okay? okay? It shines. Jeff, let me correct you. It shines. You. Let me correct you. He does beautiful things sometimes. Let's not get carried away all the time. Sometimes. Today's one of those sometimes. All right, Jeff Passan, appreciate, what up? <laughs> appreciate you. Uh, keep us up to speed on the latest. <laughs> Thanks, we want to see. <laughs> Welcome back. Art Bryles informed Grambling State University Monday that he'll no longer be the school's offensive coordinator. Bryles' decision comes after the hire by first-year coach Hugh Jackson received a firestorm of criticism. Bryles was fired by Baylor in 2016 after a campus-wide sexual assault investigation led to an independent investigation in his subsequent dismissal. Bryles putting out this statement. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of your coaching staff at Grambling State University. Fortunately, I feel that my continued presence will be a distraction to you and your team which is the last thing that I want. I have the utmost respect for the university and the players. Yesterday, before Bryles resigned, Hugh Jackson, through his foundation, released a statement explaining that Bryles' hire was a testament to forgiveness, redemption, and enlightenment. Sam Acho here with us now. Sam, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. And I will start with you here. Uh, was this the right decision for Art Bryles to resign? It absolutely was the right decision. And more than that, it was the only decision. Uh, if you go back and look at just the history and the culture that Art Bryles pretty much helped foster, along with Ian McCraw, the athletic director at Baylor, uh, it was a culture uh, uh, of sexual violence against women, if we're just going to call a spade a spade. And so after that, even though there was success on the football field, you cannot hire a coach who helped foster or didn't do anything about that kind of culture. I mean, just go down the list of, 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 of accusations of, of rape, of sexual assault. I mean, like, I, it, was, it was disgusting for me to read. Yes. And so for me, seeing Art Bryles not only get hired, uh, but even seeing Hugh, Jackman, Hugh, ja Hugh Jackson's statement saying that, well, this is about a different story and we believe all these things, I didn't buy it. I wasn't buying it. And so I think, I think, he, I think that the right decision was made, number one. And I just think that Art Bryles is probably not going to coach again, at least at a, at a collegiate or a professional level. A <sighs> couple of things. Yeah. Uh, number one, I think that Art Bryles definitely made the right decision. Uh, he was compelled to do so as he should have been. Um, at some point in time, we can have a discussion about what Hugh Jackson alluded to in his letter, forgiveness and all the things that come with it, second chances, et cetera, et cetera, because the man has been out of college and professional football for six years. And so if people say he should never coach again, that should be a discussion. Okay. That should be something people feel differently about it. I had, I, I spoke to RG3 last week. Um, he couldn't make it today, but I spoke to him. He obviously won the Heisman playing for Art Browse and what have you. And he has different feelings about that man because it's a man that he loves and respects. And although he doesn't, he didn't condone anything, but he definitely would have a different take than most of us would yeah. have. And so, you know, one day when RG3 is available and he's free to have that discussion, I promised him that I would I would try to refrain from talking about Browse too much until he was sitting in front of me mm -hmm. because this is a man that has a different perspective on Art Browse, Acho, that most of us obviously don't have. Fair enough, but based on what Acho just highlighted and what he just explained, Art Browse uh, is not somebody that's welcomed in the ranks of college football because you're playing a leadership role with men and clearly you were at the very least negligent in your duties as head coach at Baylor in that regard. Yeah. I will say, he ain't alone. Kenneth Starr, who was the head of the university, he resigned. Yeah. The athletic director resigned. So that gave indications that the problems 
existed throughout the university itself, not just in the athletic program. So you got to wonder what kind of heavy hand mm -hmm. came down on our brows once these allegations were reported or they became aware of them. That's a story, no doubt. That ain't my focus. Right now, today, my focus is on Coach Hugh Jackson of the Grambling State Tigers. I'm going to preface my comments by saying Hugh Jackson has been a guest on this show. We've all been fond of Hugh Jackson for years. To his family, children, and others who are watching, we're not here to cast any aspersions on that man. Talk to most people. Hugh Jackson is a good man. That's not what this conversation is about. This ain't to character assassinate him, to excoriate him as a man, as a human being, or as a person. Mm -hmm. This is about the, the choice that he made involving the specific hiring of Art Browse. It was an egregious decision. And it's something that has made Hugh Jackson look very, very bad for years to come. Because think about what has transpired. You are Hugh Jackson, and I want y'all to put Acho up on the screen because I want to look at Acho while I'm talking to him right now. Acho, Hugh Jackson was on national television two weeks earlier decrying the state of affairs involving minority hires in the National Football League. This is why he was the coach yeah. at Grambling. Now, it would be one thing if you were in <laughs> Cleveland and, you know, and you were talking about it. No, once Brian Flores put forth his civil action lawsuit against the Giants, the Denver Broncos, the Miami Dolphins, and the National Football League, Hugh Jackson, who was supposed to be minding his business down in, in, in Louisiana at Grambling State, decided to come front and center and speak about that issue along with the fact that minorities weren't being hired. It was, Phil, it was Hugh Jackson that once spoke to the Fritz Pollard Alliance. And he talked about issues that minorities had getting jobs. It was Hugh Jackson that, according to my sources, was in tears while addressing people on the diversity committee like Kim Bagula and others because of how minorities were being treated in terms of opportunities denied to them while he was coaching in the NFL and looking to get an opportunity. And that Hugh Jackson ends up at an historically black college and university and decides to hire an Aunt Bryles with that track record to be a leader of young black men. Do you have any idea how bad that looks? The answer would be no. Hugh Jackson didn't have an idea. He was defiant. He was very resolute in his thoughts. Um, I was told, if you know anything about Hugh, understand. Hugh was very popular for saying, particularly when he was the head coach in Cleveland. When you're the head coach, you can do what you want. Hugh is very popular of, of, and known for being a contrarian. And he fights for the underdog. Art Browse, nobody wanted him. Well, once upon a time, Hugh Jackson felt like nobody wanted him. And so he can relate. And that would be enough for him to say to hell with everybody, I'm going to do what I want to do because I'm used to adversity. Okay? So we can bring up, oh, you're trying to compete with primetime Deion Sanders and all of this stuff, making noise, making inroads, making headlines because you knew at the HBCU level being the head coach of Grambling. I ain't thinking about any of that. All I'm thinking about is the fact that Hugh Jackson had a history of fighting these issues on behalf of, an Afri of African American coaches. I'm not saying that the man couldn't hire a white coach at an HBCU. I can tell you right now, considering the scarcity or the paucity of opportunities accorded to black coaches, it would have been nice to see you high, hire a black coach in that position, but that's neither here nor there because there's plenty of qualified white coaches and I want to be clear about that. But that's the white coach that you hire? That's on Hugh Jackson's resume forever. If you're the president, the chancellor of Grambling State, if you're the athletic director, y'all might have co-signed it, but y'all didn't know this kind of heat was coming. And in the end, where you gonna look? 
You're going to look to the coach that you just hired in December and said, you brought us all this heat? So clearly the decision came from up top to compel Art Browse to go. Now, I don't know that. It could have been Art Browse on his own, but I doubt it. I suspect the university had its trepidation once the heat came down upon them. But no matter which direction you look in, Acho, it comes right back to you. How in God's name could you make this call at an HBCU after the battles you've been known to fight as recently as two weeks earlier on national television on Sports Center, lamenting the lack of opportunities for black coaches. You get it, and this is what you do. There is no getting around that. And Hugh Jackson, I don't want anybody to think that he is anything less than a good man just because you're stubborn or hard-headed or truculent because you believe what you're doing is right doesn't make you a bad person by any stretch of the imagination. But to make this decision, it will live in infamy that Hugh Jackson made this call to begin with. Go ahead, Acho. Uh, Stephen A., I, I'm, with, I, I'm with you on everything that you said, but I think there's a, a bigger picture, maybe even a bigger conversation that needs to be had because when it comes to college football, pro football, really any level of football going on to high school football, it seems as if people care more about winning than integrity. Yeah. They care more about your final record than it comes to uh, your character. And so take out, no matter what league you play in, whether it's the XFL, Canadian football, high school, NFL, college, winning matters. And here's why I say that winning matters, at least from what I've experienced in my four years in college, going to national championship, nine years in the NFL, going to the playoffs. Uh, Art Bryles in 2013 at Baylor won the Big 12 while all this sexual misconduct was going on. He won it the next year as well. While all this sexual misconduct was going on, it had been going on years before, it had been reported, and he got, he got rewarded with a, with a new 10-year contract. And in fact, Baylor got rewarded with a brand new stadium, McLean Stadium, right, RG3. He played in the old stadium, helped in a lot of ways with the wins that the team had. They built a new stadium. They were rewarded. And so for me, I care more about character and integrity than I do about wins and losses. But society may not care more about okay. character and integrity. So when Hugh Jackson says, I'm hiring Art Bryles so I want to compete, he might be going with the societal standards of like, hey, let's forgive, if you will, quote unquote, and then worry about wins and losses because right. that's what society hey, rewards. Is it okay? We gotta go. No, can, can I but is that what happens? Yes. I know we Say got. I, thing, I know we got to go, Acho and Molly. I'm gonna give this to you. Yeah. Black coaches are a brotherhood. Yeah. I've spoken to many. I can't find one that is okay. Not one. Yeah. That's okay with this call Hugh Jackson made. Absolutely. And I just want to say this very quickly. I know we've got to get to the top of the hour real quick. Um, obviously, this was the right decision. You heard my thoughts on this for Art Browse to resign. Obviously, it was an egregious hiring by Hugh Jackson. It was baffling on many levels, especially how hard he went for Brian Flores. But I do want to say this. I do applaud Hugh Jackson because he does have a foundation yes. fighting human trafficking. Yes. That is the third most profitable crime. There's 40 million people trafficked globally. It is modern day slavery. So I do want to applaud him for putting his time and energy into that and it's an issue many people stay away from because it can, can be very dark and ugly Absolutely. but it needs to be addressed so so we do need to applaud him we only uh, on going about end. this decision no absolutely nothing else about him but, nothing else yes, about Hugh but, Jackson. but i just want to say he, he, he is tackling this one yes. head on uh sam macho you're excellent you'll be back guys let's get in a break here coming up oh my god after gotta be the 50 ball man first in history mm -hmm. I ain't gonna lie. I don't know if I can talk about that right now, man. My head all over the place. He's a beautiful player. I mean, you know, what else can you say about him? And it's not just that he's athletic. And everybody says, hey, he's athletic. Somebody says, you know, he's a freak of nature, you know, because he's so fast and he's this. But, you know, he, he makes decisions. Uh, he's, he knows what's going on in the court. So, you know, you combine that cerebral part of his game with the athleticism and you got a special kid. 
You know, Stephen A, did you see this tweet by your boy AI? Remember when he won the MVP? But that was back in 2001, and he's saying sooner or later for Ja Morant. Mm -hmm. Monica McNutt back here with us. So, Stephen A, what do you think? Is, is he the MVP well, well, right now? Because he's the show. He could be. I think it's a four-horse race, and it's fluid between. Four? Four. If you watch Jokic and what he's doing in Denver, I would say it's three because obviously Memphis is a better team than Denver. But look at what Jokic is doing without Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. And Michael Porter Jr. is a really, really good player. I want to remind everybody, Jamal Murray was a star mm -hmm. before he got hurt. This is a yeah. brother that showed yeah, up in the playoffs against Donovan Mitchell, and they were trading 50-point games. We keep forgetting what a star Jamal Murray was. And, it, and I believe will be once he gets back, but he's been out for a while. Jokic is not playing without one of them. He's playing without both of them. And it's kept Denver in contention in the West. Let's respect that man, all right? Now, we got to put him on the outside looking in because John Moran in Memphis is obviously better. That brings us to a three-horse race. I know Miami just took the lead, but the bottom line is Chicago was the number one seed for a while while DeMar DeRozan was holding them there, putting up 35-plus in seven straight, eight straight games and doing what the hell he was doing. And, of course, there's Joe L. Embiid who was doing what he's doing while Ben Simmons and all of that soap opera drama that was going on was supposed to be detracting from what Philadelphia could do. If, ben, if Joel Embiid somehow, someway, still ends up doing what he did prior to Harden's arrival, while Harden is there now on the court with him, that's going to warrant strong consideration. But John ja Morant is something spectacular, and we should all be so grateful to him because the league was supposed to be in his hands and Zion Williamson's hands and a few others. And Zion Williamson obviously being out. Ben Simmons with the drama. Kyrie Irving with the vaccine mandate and stuff like this. There were so many things that were threatening to rob this phenomenal season of what it was supposed to be. And John Morant, particularly last night, reminded us, excuse me, season ain't over yet. It's actually just beginning. Steph Curry put on the show. Kevin Durant was putting on the show. Klay Thompson returned. It's Chris Paul and Devin Booker and those boys doing their thing. And, you know, and you saw LaMelo and Bridges and them in Charlotte, DeRozan and Levine in Chicago, and Bede in Philadelphia. Boston coming on strong. You do, you dunk is doing a hell of a job. You know, Jason Tatum, uh, Jalen Brown and those boys balling. And John Moran is like, yeah. He's giving everybody something to shoot for because he ain't next. He's now. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree with everything that you said, Stephen A., including the fact that this MVP thing is going to go down to the wire. I think probably the biggest argument against Ja is the streak of games he missed. I believe it was 12 earlier in the season. Yeah, and the Memphis Grizzlies like managed to hold pace. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I think over that stretch, the Memphis Grizzlies held pace and they did not lose. And I think that speaks to the talent on that roster and the tremendous coaching job that Taylor Jenkins is doing, who should, certainly should be in the conversation for coach of the year. Um, right this minute, though, I'm willing to give it to Ja. I'm absolutely willing to give it to Ja. And all those players that you mentioned, Stephen A., the point that you make about Nikola Jokic is probably the most intriguing, but I don't know that the return of Jamal Murray would help his case as MVP. But as I'm digging through the numbers, his PER is 32.2 and has 11.3 win shares with that team. And so he's been incredible. Where they fall in the standings obviously hurts his case. But when it comes to Ja, I just look at the numbers, the consistency, the energy, the box office quality, and whether we want to admit it or not, the box office nature of a guy does tend to lean into this conversation. You're damn right. And I'm a voter. I'm telling you it does. Right. Oh, absolutely. So his squad is so young. And so when I, when I look at what's around him and the help, not that those guys are not good, but Joel Embiid is going to have J Jamar, Jamar, excuse me, James Harden moving forward, right? Jamar DeRozan, who's been incredible, and I really was leaning that way before yesterday. Um, Zach Levine has been great, and when and when uh, the big shows up for his team, why am I blanking on name? Valanciunas, when he shows up, I think he's very formidable with that group. So right now for me, it's Ja. It, I think the way well, that he leads, the way that he entertains on both sides of the floor, to me, it's Ja right now. I don't have a problem with that. What I'm saying to you is this, Monica. Be very clear about this. If Jamal Murray was in Denver, 
Jokic's oh, yeah. numbers would be the same, but their wins would not be. They'd have more. Let me be very clear about that. We wouldn't be looking at Denver as some sixth or seventh seed. We'd be looking at Denver as a top four seed in the West if Jamal Murray was there with Jokic. I, Ain't no doubt about that. I agree that. with you. I agree with you. I do think he's scoring a little bit less. But you could argue that the assist numbers would be up. But I, I, I agree with you. 100% if they were healthy, that's a different team. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. As far as Gunt would say, that's all I have to say about that. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Life is like a box of chocolate. You never know, you never what, know what you never know what you're gonna get. I'm not gonna try to do the accent. Right. He's the thespian, not me. All right, let me ask you this, though, Stephen A. In terms of plays, what did you think was more impressive, that dunk or the buzzer beater he had? Let, let's see both of them. The buzzer beater he had at the half to take the lead. I think it was easily the dunk. To me, the real play, even though that was a damn good play, yeah. the real play was the pass. I mean, that was an incredible, yeah. that was an incredible yeah. pass. That dunk, that, now that's different. Yeah. That's different. That's different level right there, okay? And look where he took off from. Oh. Mm -hmm. See, see, uh, you, you, nah, 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 let, me, let me stop this. Let me stop okay. this, okay? You're talking to a brother that covered Allen Iverson. Yeah. For the <sighs> first 10 years of his career. From his second year in the league to the time he left for, for you know, for, for Denver. I'm, we're talking to a man that was courtside every game for Allen Iverson's career, who covered every practice, yeah. okay, went on every road trip. I was the beat writer for the Philadelphia 76ers. Yeah. And I'm telling you right now, the shows that this brother put on, it was just because Allen Iverson never won a title. Do you know what we say about Allen Iverson? Kobe and Shaq stopped What do we say? Think about how complimentary that is. Kobe and Shaq stopped him. That's what it took to stop a six-foot guard, okay, that was basically the lone offensive weapon on the Philadelphia 76ers. Props to Billy King, <laughs> Larry Brown, Pat Croce, and the crew for building a team around him, understanding who he was and what he needed. And all those brothers, Aaron McKee, George Lynch, the Kevin Tubble, yeah. Tyrone Hill, you know, all the, whole, the whole crew, Eric Snow, all of them, yeah. because they all knew their roles and they played it. But he was the lone offensive dude at six feet, 160 Answer. pounds, and a warrior. And we have seen Derrick Rose bigger. Yeah. Obviously more athletic. We've seen Russell Westbrook, bigger, more athletic. But when you look at Ja Morant, mm -hmm. I mentioned Kevin Durant earlier because they both the number two picks and the number one pick were injury yeah. prone. But when you look at Ja Morant and his game, I mean, that's just a slightly taller version of Allen Iverson. That's, that's who Allen Iverson was. Yeah, and we're here for it all day. Warrior. Yeah. I'm just saying. This warms Absolutely. my blue and gray Hoya heart. Yes, <laughs> shout out to my Hoyas. Shout out to AI. That's all right. <laughs> there we go. Oh, by the way, by, 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 the way yeah. by the way, he says hello to you, Monica. You know he and I talk all the time. I, He's very proud of you and the job. I appreciate that. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, we ain't talking about, we talking about Monica and the Georgetown <laughs> that was. We ain't talking about the Georgetown that is right now. We didn't, come on, man, we get, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't need this, this distinction. I, I got to get to Kyrie Irving. All right, let's go. Roll the bumps. Roll the bumps. He always has to take it a little too far. Still ahead oh, on, on. on the street on CNBC, New York City Mayor Eric Adams addressed his upcoming loosening of the city's vaccine mandate, which would allow unvaccinated Kyrie Irving to enter the Barclays Center for games but not plays. Adams saying this, listen, I want Kyrie on the court. I would do anything to get that ring. So badly I want it, but there's so much at stake here. It would send the wrong message just to have an exception for one player when we're telling countless number of New York City employees, if you don't follow the rules, you won't be able to be employed. Let me just say this, Stephen A. This is when I am grateful I'm the host teeing up the question and not a debater. This is a difficult one. It's not. It's so difficult. Allow me okay, to tell me why it's not. Allow me to explain. Um, Mayor Adams, <clears throat> first of all, if anybody hasn't seen SNL spoof Mayor Eric Adams, you need to get Chris <laughs> Red. It's spectacular. No. I've it's seen the them, them spoof the, you. Yeah, yeah, and they were good with me, especially Michael Irvin. <laughs> Keenan Thompson was hilarious with Michael Irvin. That was a mala, 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 mala. I mean, that was hilarious, okay? Keenan Thompson was spectacular. But this kid, Chris Red, doing Eric Adams, yeah. 
it's, it's the funniest stuff that I've seen all year. They're geniuses. On Having show. said all of that, Mayor Eric Adams, who I like, I'm not casting any aspersions with you with what I'm saying. Please don't take it. And you're welcome to come on the show anytime. I'm happy to have you on First Take, sir, to discuss this issue. Nobody's asking you to make an exception for Kyrie Irving. We're asking you to eradicate the rule because it's a stupid rule. That's why. There's no debating this. You are a visitor, so you are allowed to come to the Barclays Center and play. But if you happen to play at the Barclays Center as your home court, you can't play. So if Kyrie Irving had gotten traded to the Philadelphia 76ers, okay, instead of James Harden, Kyrie Irving could play at the Barclays Center. But Kyrie Irving, the member of the Brooklyn Nets, can't play at the Barclays Center. I don't get that. Kyrie doesn't get that. Commissioner Adam Silver doesn't get that, along with a host of other people. It's a stupid rule, plain and simple. And when you talk about people, you talk about medical workers and law enforcement officials and stuff like that. They're city employees. I still don't like the rule. I still don't. But when you talk about indoor restaurants, indoor facilities, and a laxing of the rules, then it should be laxed for an indoor facility like the Barclay Center, especially when the rule is not applicable to visitors inside the Barclay Center. It makes no sense. I can't believe that I have to sit up here and defend Kyrie Irving, but he deserves to be defended. Kyrie Irving, me and his decision-making, always finding an excuse to be off of work in his career, I stand by that. I haven't changed that position. <laughs> but that has nothing to do with this, with this situation. Kyrie Irving is a victim. Kyrie Irving is being screwed over because of a rule that is not applicable to his contemporaries from different cities who happen to come visit the Barclay Center. That is why, Eric Adams, we are asking you to change the rule. We're not asking you to change the rule for Kyrie Irving. We're asking you to change a rule that evidently isn't applicable to other people visiting the Barclay Center. You're either all in or you all out. If the rule is in place, the rule should be applicable to visitors coming to that place, not just for people who reside in that place. It makes no sense. Monica, Monica can I ask you a question? I, I get that the rules yes, are double standard, but at the same time, do you get where Mayor Eric Adams is coming from, where this could send the wrong message? Even if the rule is bogus, it looks like, hey, we're making an exception for this multimillionaire athlete and how that would look to the rest of New Yorkers who have been sacrificing. Yes, Molly. I understand Mayor Adams pointing out an exception, but I do with, agree with Stephen A in that it's not necessarily an exception that's being asked for. The qualm is that the rules should be done. Now, I, I was struck by this idea of public versus private sector, and quite honestly, it was a bit confusing for me. As I understand it, it maintains that Kyrie is an employee, and so the mandate still applies to employees of businesses here in New York. Um, but to me, on a very base level, at this point, if he's allowed to be in the gym, he should be allowed to play in the gym. And when we talk about fitness gyms for the average person, if there's no longer a vaccine check at the door and so on and so forth, and businesses are being allowed to proceed, now we're getting into what are we doing? And I will admit, Molly, that initially I was able to make the argument or had the capacity to understand the idea of folks that exist in New York on a daily basis, whether they are residents or people that work here nine to five, five days a week, the idea that if we can get people that live here to abide by the rule, we can protect ourselves and tourism be, be what it may. But now, if Kyrie's allowed to be present, I don't understand why he's not allowed to play, particularly because the NBA is still testing, as I understand. Well, again, that's your position, and I respect it. My position, as far as I'm concerned, is far more profound. You're allowing visitors to come into... Listen, you're... think about it this way, y'all. <clears throat> if I live in New York City, right? Yeah. And Eminem and Molly Q yeah. and Stephen A decide to go out to dinner, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, what according to New York, if you reside in that place in New York City, you can't come to the restaurant with us 
because you ain't vaccinated. But if you a visitor, yeah. you can join us. Now, how stupid is that? I think, I think their thought process behind it, I get that it's right. totally bogus. Even right. Adam Silver I, said it was bogus, was because you're only here for a short amount of time. I understand so they that. don't think that under, contamination right. will happen. I, I understand that. But the point of the matter is we've learned as an, I, listen, I came down with ain't nobody, nobody going to tell me anything. You don't need multiple <laughs> bites at the apple to get COVID, okay? Yeah. All it takes is one shot. Okay, this is why people insist on masks while we're on the airplanes, yeah. for example, because, you know, you want to do whatever you can to protect because, you know, all it takes is that trip on a plane for you to get contaminated. I don't want to hear, well, it's a visitor as opposed to somebody at home. So it's the difference. The fact of the matter is get rid of the rule. At this point, it's utterly stupid, particularly when the mandate has been laxed to some degree in the public sector at the very least. The bottom line is you got yeah. Kyrie Irving yeah. who deserves to be playing at the Barclays Center because you're willing to allow visitors to play at the Barclays Center, even if they're unvaccinated. That is the principled position, and Kyrie Irving is being screwed over on this. I'm with you. I think it's mm. so bogus. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, I can sympathize and empathize with Mayor Eric Adams because he's just scared well, I'm not of blaming him. falling Trying on his shoulder. Well, I'm not blaming God, him. God, he, God he wants to hold the line. Yeah. It's yeah. not just that. It's I, not I his fault. If numbers ever rose again, it, that, it, I understand where he's scared. fairness to him, he didn't, he didn't invoke. The mandate. Yeah. That was his predecessor, okay, yeah. uh, who I don't even want to talk about. I don't even talk about him for various different reasons, okay? But Eric Adams, we'll see what he does. I got faith in the brother. I'm not excoriating him. I'm just simply saying, now that we are here, we're here. Stop with this nonsense. Get rid of this nonsensical stuff. Get Kyrie back in the Barclays Center so the citizens of <laughs> Brooklyn can finally get to see what they deserve yeah. to see instead of, visit, instead of visitors coming into the Barclays Center. That's the bottom line. Yeah, at the end of the day, I think we're going to see him play for Oh, sure, we should. I, and I, I, yeah. I do. It's bogus. Do get too. rid of it. Monica, you are dismissed, my dear. Excellent job, as always. Thank you so much. Have Sorry a wonderful Georgia. rest of the day. Sorry about Georgia. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Y'all enjoy LA. Foul. All right. <laughs> Coming up, friends of the <laughs> show to either the New York football giants, let's go, Big Blue, don't screw this up, or the <laughs> Jets, with both teams looking to sure up the defensive side of the ball. Don't laugh. You don't have a quarterback either, Stephen A. Mm -hmm. With that being said, we bring in my guy, Mel Kuyper Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mel, so good to see you. I'm going to save all the pleasantries because we have questions and yeah. we need answers. Uh -huh. First, let's start with this. Is there a superstar quarterback in this draft that could change the fortunes of a franchise? Right now, you would say no. Now, could there be? Sure. Derek Carr is a pretty good quarterback, right? He was a second-round pick. I compare Kenny Pickett to Derek Carr. So if you think Derek Carr is a really good quarterback, which he is, super, we may look back on this draft and say, hey, this draft that everybody wasn't excited about the quarterbacks, the quarterbacks turned out to produce one quarterback that was spectacular and was underdrafted, should have been in the top five, maybe should have been number one overall, but it got pushed down to that 11 spot or 20 spot. So right now, I would say no, but I would maybe bet on one of these guys, Molly and Stephen A, turning out to be really, really good. Okay. I have this look on my face, Mel Kuyper, because you're not giving me good news. You know, I mean, I care about my Steelers. <laughs> ben Roethlisberger has retired, okay? We got this guy from Pitt named Kenny Pickett you just brought up, and you're telling me, I mean, he, he could be the next Derek Carr, potentially. 42 touchdowns, seven interceptions, over four, you know, I mean, completed 67% of his passes. Had a good year last year, number three, high draw. I get all that. But, I, I mean, if this brother ain't going to fall to the Steelers at number 20, I mean, what hope do I have, Mel Kuyper Jr.? Are you here to give me bad news? Is that what you're doing? I, I know what you're, what you're looking for, Steve. I think 20, Todd had him turning up to get Malik Willis. I'm not going that route. I'm thinking maybe like Mac Jones fell to New England. Maybe Malik Willis falls to Pittsburgh. If they want to move up and get him, you got New Orleans, you got Washington at 11. Could take, I just think Ron Rivera wants a quarterback who can come right in. 24-year-old rookie was what Kenny will be. 49, 50 career starts under his belt. Played for a great coordinator, quarterback coach, and Mark Whipple. Mark's now at Nebraska. I think everything sets up for Pickett to be ready to go, where Malik Willis is going to take a little bit of time. So if you have a quarterback in place, the Steelers have to get that bridge quarterback, Stephen A. If you draft Malik Willis, get a bridge quarterback, and then maybe in year two, year three, turn the reins over to Malik Willis. Now, we say that every year, and I know Susie Colbert always said they always play. 
I don't want to talk about sit, watch, and learn. They're going to play. Yeah. In Malik Willis's case, a year to sit, watch, and learn, like kind of Trey Lance kind of did, like Patrick Mahomes did do, uh, I think would benefit him tremendously. Okay, I should go to Trey Lance because you just tra transitioned, but I'll let Stephen A. do the whole Jimmy G thing. And I want to talk about my Giants. So we made some changes. New GM, okay. new coach. I don't want a bridge quarterback, Mel Kuyper Jr. I want to win. It's been real bad in New York. Now, we have Daniel Jones, Danny Dimes. John Mara just came out and said they're sticking with him. Do you think this is the right decision? 100%. I do. Uh, I'm not one to bail on quarterbacks. Uh, you have to have patience with quarterbacks. You can't just kick them to the curb when it's not his fault. If it was his fault, if he had everything around him working, the O-line doing their job, Barkley healthy all year, running well, receivers healthy and catching the football for a change on a consistent basis, I'm about more Evan Engram, then all of a sudden you say to Daniel Jones, you're not getting the ball security, he's more eliminated, that is a big problem. If everything around him is hitting on all cylinders and he's still not getting it done in winning games, then it's certainly after this year you move on. But give Daniel Jones a fighting chance. I don't think the problem is Daniel Jones. We'll find out at the end of the year. He might be yeah. telling me this time next year you're wrong. If I'm wrong, fine. But I would stick. Certainly, I have confidence that Daniel Jones has the ability, the mindset to win football games if he gets a little help on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, they need to shore up the O line. How long have we been saying that for? Stephen A, go ahead. Let me go to a subject near and dear to Molly Q's heart. What? Type of what subject is that? I mean, Jimmy Garoppolo, yeah, a.k.a. Sure. Jimmy G. Last year, the so 49ers stupid. drafted Trey Lance, number three overall. And while he did get some playing time, Jimmy G was the starter for most of the year and the playoffs. Do you think they should turn to Lance now or stick with Jimmy G? They have to figure it out. I mean, they know what Trey Lance is more than anybody else. They have, if they have a plan that says, okay, we trade him for a second-round pick, then fine. They did it in Kansas City with Alex Smith when he had Patrick Mahomes ready. So if they feel Trey Lance can be what Patrick Mahomes was, remember, it's a little different, though. You're talking about a kid, one start in 2020, never played against a 1A team, okay? So he was all 1AA his entire career. And just like I say, that one game in Central Arkansas in 2020 where he was an impressive throw and he was an Well, it was enough for Carson Wentz to get drafted to number one. two overall. Carson Wentz got drafted What's number two today? overall. I said Carson Wentz got drafted number two overall out of North yeah. Dakota State. Right. What I'm saying is in this particular case of Trey, Trey needs to work on his passing skills, his accuracy. He, if he did enough, if they feel he's ready, he's evolved enough and improved enough, then you move on. I get that. But Jimmy G had him in a Super Bowl. He almost had him in another one with a thumb injury that was affecting him, yet he played through it. The mm. players love this guy. And, you know, if you want to cut ties to like Jimmy it. G and move on with a second-round pick, fine. But you got to believe that Trey Lance is ready to go. And if you, because your team's ready to roll, you can't be, you have the quarterback holding you back. Jimmy G doesn't hold him back. Now, will Trey Lance be better than Jimmy G? He should be. He oh, what about how they feel about Jimmy G, Mel Kuyper Jr.? I mean, he was on their squad. He had taken them to a Super Bowl, and they still spent the number three overall pick on Trey Lance. What about what they might feel about Jimmy G and how they feel he's not the one? Well, he's going to be a lot better than Jimmy G with the talent you already have okay, assembled. Then you make that move. But is he going to be ready? And will he be that guy? We don't know. He was a work in progress. He has to work on accuracy. They know that better than anybody else. Now, if you believe Trey Lance is ready to roll big time, then you trade Jimmy Garoppolo. If you Mel, don't, you me, keep Jimmy G. Mel, let me get in here real quick because we got to go. I keep getting wrapped in my ear. But i got two more things sure. I need to ask you. Why am I the only person that still cares about Russell Wilson? I feel like I keep bringing him up. The Giants should bring in Russell Wilson. He might be on the move. And it seems like all our analysts here are down on him and his talent. Do you think Russell Wilson still has it? I don't know how you can be down on Russell Wilson. I mean, he, he should have won two Super Bowls. He won one, was a play away from winning two. Yeah, the talent there in Seattle, I don't think they, do they want, does Pete Carroll want to cut ties with Russell Wilson? Move on from Russell, for, to what? Who's replacing him? And if he can go somewhere else, yeah, and he can hand pick it. If he can go, so I want Russell Wilson, but I can't believe Seattle would let him go. Not in that division. Come on. Well, you know, but if they do, well, stranger quick, things have happened, but I don't know how you quick. can be down on Russell Wilson. That's, Nobody, I have to no, explain that one That too. is not true. Oh, the, nobody's down on Russell that Wilson's is, talent. We just believe that Sierra is more of an attractive subject than he that's is. That's a lie, man. Kyler Murray. I, I got to sneak in Kyler Murray here. <laughs> what are your thoughts about what's going on with him in Arizona? How do you feel about what you see from Kyler Murray? 
I like Kyler. I, I'm a little mystified by what I'm hearing. I, I don't get the problem, the contract, like you're saying. I know we've talked about it. Has he done enough? He hasn't done what Josh Allen did yet. Now, you know, Josh Allen was doing special things in year two, year three, now in year four, and he got it before year four. Kyler started off great, then issues happened, Hopkins injury. There were a lot of things were going on there to affect him positively, and then when things went awry negatively. That's my point with Daniel Jones. Quarterbacks need help. If they don't get it, they can look really good when they get help. They can look really bad when they don't, okay? So in, in the terms of, of Kyler, the whole thing going on there with the contract, that's a separate issue. In terms of him being a quarterback, he's a real good one. He could be a great one, and he's young. So you got the guy. You make him happy. Come together. What's the deal here? Okay. Come on. Okay. All right. Here's the deal. We still need to talk to you about Aaron Rodgers. We still need to talk to you about defense in this draft. So what this means is you need to come back. So come talk, back. talk to the producers. I need more time with you. This is not enough. I feel very rushed. Mel, thank you for the time. Thank you for the visit. We'll talk to you. Thanks, soon. guys. Appreciate Much it. Much more first.